UCS system. I do not mean the UCS server, so the C-series servers. No, I have, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the blade system. So the UCS B-series. The UCS B-series are using a very special management system and have a couple features that are unique for blade systems in the world. Of course, Cisco focuses on this heavily in the lab. About 30% of the points in your lab will be about the UCS section. The UCS, so uh, unfortunately in your lab, uh, you only have available the UCS simulator, which is actually an excellent one. So you can emula emulate all the management interface uh, GUI options that are available to you. So you can do anything in the GUI that you can do in the real UCS. I want to focus on the real UCS hardware because I have the real UCS available. I will focus a lot on uh, how everything comes together in terms of interfaces and in terms of show commands that you can use on the fabric interconnects to make sure that you verify your solution correctly. So let's first talk a little bit about the hardware itself. And with the hardware, I already start talking a lot about the networking part. So to start with a hardware overview, I want to begin with the UCS system itself. So we're talking about the blade servers. It's also, uh, it's also possible to connect the C-series servers to this management option. Chances are slim that uh, Cisco will do this in the lab because there is not much different configuration necessary to get that up and running than if you would configure a blade. So it's not very different from configuring blades than to add servers into that fabric interconnect. So the C-series servers are only there for verification of fiber channel over Etherweek. A B5108 blade chassis is the only chassis available of the UCS system. This is because Cisco doesn't scale in terms of uh, chassis scale but they scale in terms of the whole solution. So I can use many different chassis and still manage them through a single point of management. Each chassis fits eight blades. There are two different blades. There are half width blades and full width blades, meaning they either consume one slot in the chassis or they consume two slots in the chassis. So this bridge between the two slots can be removed and that means that I can fit a full width blade here in two different slots uh, in the UCS B5108 chassis. Now these chassis cannot work independently. If I only buy a chassis and a couple blades I'm not done. I cannot do anything with my server or with my chassis and why is that? Well when we start looking at the back of the chassis, we see a couple fan modules, uh, some power supply sockets, more fans, and more importantly, some network connectivity. This network connectivity with either four or eight ports are not switches. So if you're used to IBM blade switches or HP blade switches, the switches in the back of the chassis are either HP switches, so the, 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 the vendor of the blade system itself, or Cisco switches. So there is a Nexus 4000 series that fits into any blade center uh, that you can do a lot of things on. These things are not switches. The things that are in the back of the chassis are fabric extenders, Nexus 2200 series. And they have a special connection as well because they cannot be managed through a Nexus switch. No, they need a special parent. So they can only be managed through that special parent device. So no local switching here on the fabric extender itself. So each packet arriving from a blade server always goes up to that parent. There is no local switching on that fabric extender here in the back of that chassis. Now that extra component that I need 
is technically in hardware a Nexus 5500 on steroids. So there is a 48 and a 96 port version, same as in the Nexus 5500 series. No layer 3 stuff, so this is a server switch, so it's not a layer 3 switch. No layer 3 option. But technically it's a Nexus 5500. It is called a UCS 6248 or 6296. That is because it's not a real Nexus 5500. It is a Nexus 5500 plus a special UCS management chip. This is called the UCS Manager or short for UCSM. If you hear the, the, the term UCSM, this is what we're talking about. That UCS management chip inside the UCS 6248. This device is called a fabric interconnect. Or FI for short. So FI is the fabric interconnect. This is not a switch. This is a fabric interconnect. The fabric interconnect consists of two parts. So in hardware, it just looks exactly the same as a Nexus 5500, except they painted exactly that, but except that they painted it green. But in, inside of the switch, inside of the device, there are two software images running. There is an NXOS image running, and there is that UCS manager software that is running. These two parts are independent of each other. So the UCS manager configures the NXOS part, but the, the, this NXOS part and this NXOS part have nothing to do with each other. So it's not a Nexus switch, so we cannot do virtual port channels, for example, or we cannot do anything that you're used to on Nexuses. No. This UCS manager will control this NXOS part. So this NXOS CLI that I have available is read only. There is no configure terminal command in the NXOS CLI here. Everything is controlled from the UCS manager. So when I take my B5108 blade chassis with those fabric extenders in the back. A fabric extender is connected to one parent, right? Or a VPC parent. Now we do not have the feature VPC available to us here on the fabric interconnect. So what we do is we connect one fabric extender to one fabric interconnect. So we just drag a couple cables one, two, three, or four cables, depending on the capacity that you need, and connect those fixes to our Nexus parent. So no crossing cables, everything is straight cabled to its fabric interconnect A and its fabric interconnect B. The UCS manager is then going to configure all the blades and all the chassis and all the fixes and everything there is to configure. So this UCS manager will have a management connection going internally, going towards these fixes and towards every component in the system. It uses some internal VLANs for that. So there is a range of reserved VLANs that is used for the UCS manager uh, management traffic. Now, if you read white papers from the competition, from HP and IBM and stuff, you will read that UCS is an active standby configuration. That is not true. The NXOS part, so the data plane, is active, active. All, both of the NXOS configurations are forwarding traffic. So I can send traffic left or I can send traffic right. That all depends on the blade that's in this chassis. So depending on the blade, I send traffic either left or right, but I can do that at the same time. 
These control planes, again, I do not have any connection between them, so they have no relationship with each other. Actually, they don't even know that they exist from each other. What is active standby is the manager. This manager is just is nothing else than one big database. That database, there can only be one active database at the same time, right? If I have two active databases, I cannot change anything in the system because I wouldn't know who is changing it. So the UCS manager is running an active standby mode. So you will have one Fabric Interconnect being the active one and one Fabric Interconnect being the standby one. So some people will think that it is an active standby situation. That's not the case. That's only for that management part. Like I said, the UCS manager is one big database. So we need to synchronize the settings in that database. What we use there is two UTP cables. These two devices will be sitting next to each other, either in, on top of each other in the same rack or maybe in uh, connecting racks, but never far from each other. So these are just two UTP cables called the L1 and L2 port the L1 and L2 port. Internally, these are called the Management 2 and Management 3 ports, but on the outside, they are called L1 and L2. These cables do nothing else than synchronizing the database between the two UCS managers. They have no relationship with the NXOS part. Of course, the other interface that belongs to the UCS manager is management zero. The management zero interface is also an interface that belongs to the UCS manager software partition. All the other interfaces on the uh, Nexus, uh, on the UCS 6248, all the 10 gig ports that are on here belong to the NXOS part. So all the 32 or 48 onboard ports are here uh, belonging to the NXOS part. And like I said, the manager configures the NXOS part. So the only interface belonging, the only outside interface belonging to the UCS manager is management zero. That is also the reason why if you do a show interface management zero on the NXOS part, you will see the configuration, but it will be in admin shutdown, administratively down. So a lot of people freak out when they see that, but that is, the case because the management zero interface belongs to the UCS manager. So let's log into a UCS system and show you that. Eighty one. Let me log into the terminal server. So the UCS is fully unconfigured right now. So what I have now is an empty configuration on my fabric interconnect. So when configuring a UCS, the only place where I configure things that I have a management GUI is here on that UCS manager part. That Fabric Interconnect is gonna be the mother of my UCS system. I, can't, I cannot do anything with my blades without configuring the UCS manager. So let's initially configure that Fabric Interconnect. So I always choose the console way because that gives me some more flexibility. How do I find the system assigned port worldwide name of a non-existing iSCSI host? If I do show interface iSCSI 1.1, that port worldwide name kind of represents all in three incoming iSCSI hosts. The thing about is what they call uh, dynamic initiators. So when you do not configure a static initiator in your iSCSI section, um, so in that static configuration, I configure that system assigned port worldwide name, right? If I just have a dynamic initiator, so I did not configure 
um, the initiator in my configuration. So it's just learning it. Um, <clears throat> so it's just learning it through the normal configuration. So it's just accepting a session from an initiator. Then it will automatically assign a port worldwide name. I do not know which one. So I do not know that upfront before the session is established. The second thing, the port worldwide name shown under the iSCSI interface, that is used only when you're using the proxy initiator mode. So the interface iSCSI 1 slash 1, that port worldwide name is only used when you enable proxy initiator mode. Because then I emulate all the initiators behind a single port worldwide name static port worldwide name system assigned how do you know what it is do a show run so uh, if i go to a mds switch uh, let me take an mds switch So this interface has a port worldwide name only used for proxy initiator mode. When I configure an initiator name IQN 2013-12-12.windows1, when I say static port worldwide name system assign one and static node worldwide name system assign, there are two ways to show what it actually allocated. So I go out of my configuration. So I could just do a show run, find the initiator, and there are the actual values. So that system assign keyword is automatically translated into a actual port worldwide name. I can also do show iSCSI initiator configured. That will show me the NWWN and the port worldwide name as well that the system assigned to me. And this is static. So two ways, show run or show iSCSI initiator configured. So back to our UCS. I always choose for the initial configuration, the console way. Otherwise, if you check GUI, it does a DHCP request for a management IP address. And usually that's not the case, right? So I just want to set up one through the console. Is this a new fabricant to connect? Yes, it is. Do I want to enforce a strong password? Well, no, and what is the password? IP export one, two, three. Will I configure a second fabric interconnect? So is this gonna be a cluster? Yes. Then what kind of fabric interconnect is this of the cluster? Is this A or is this B? This is A. What is the host name? I'm calling it UCS1. What is the physical IP address? So. What is the management zero address of FIA? So you can imagine that I also need to specify a management IP address of FIB later. 10.10.2.10.81. Subnet mask slash 24. Default gateway. And now what is the cluster IP address? So along with that physical address here, there's always going to be a cluster address, which is always the active IP address. So on this management zero interface, the cluster IP address is going to respond to the active UCS manager and to the active only. So it's not, so on the standby, this is going to ignore the cluster IP address until it takes over from the active. So the cluster is an IP address that I can also always point to, always address. And that means that I can automatically uh, uh, join the UCS manager or see the UCS manager. So that's 83. I don't care about DNS. I don't care about the domain name. Save configuration. Now always configure your fabric interconnect A and B separately. Never configure them at the same time. So wait for this configuration to be applied before doing B. And I'll show you why. 
This is probably not something you do in the lab because this will probably be done for you. So this configuration takes a while and they will probably have everything pre-configured for you. So at least the, the management IP addressing will be pre-configured for you. And now I can log in. So now I go away and I log into my Fabric Interconnect B through the console. Again, I get the same question, but now I get a new question that says it detected another already configured Fabric Interconnect through those L1 and L2 cables. Do you want me to add this to the same cluster? Well, yes, of course. Why would I otherwise connect you to it? What is the admin password of the configuration that you did? So now it's going to log in to that other Fabric Interconnect and it's going to take the configuration including the default gateway, the net mask, and the cluster IP address to know exactly what is the configuration of the other one. So what remains is, what is the physical IP of FIB? 82. Save it, yes. So that saves me a lot of questions, right? So that's why I need to wait for the applying of the configuration on FIA before I start configuring FIB. And that's done. So now we should be able to establish a session. Come on. So sometimes it takes a while for the session to be established. Uh, 83 is the cluster IP address. Ah, the cluster IP address takes a while. There we go. So now we drop into the UCS CLI. So actually the only command that I can do here is show cluster status, state, see who is the primary and who is the subordinate switch or fabric interconnect, and I can see my configuration. This configuration is unreadable. Well, it is not a very fast CLI to run into. So what this is actually is, is a XML file, just without the XML tags, showing you all the settings of the system. For the lab, do not focus on knowing this CLI. Don't care about it, use the GUI. Nobody uses this. Unless you're scripting something, nobody manually configure this, unless you're copying and pasting some stuff. So some people like to use this for some reasons. I don't see why you cannot use the GUI because the GUI is a pretty, pretty well designed GUI. Although it uses Java, so that makes it a bad GUI right away. But there are some good things about it and it works pretty fast actually, if you know your way around. By the way, if you're looking for scripting on the UCS, uh, go check out the PowerShell extensions that they have. So the PowerShell extensions are very well written and you can do a lot of things with them and take all kinds of information outside of the UCS, uh, do some configuration, works very well. But what's more importantly besides this CLI is that I can hop from that UCS manager, from this piece of the puzzle, I can hop to all components in the system. So I can just do telnet to other components in the system. So from the UCS manager, what I can do is telnet, or I don't know what it does, it does an R login, I believe, to all components in the system. So I can log in, first of all, to the NXOS part, but also to the NXOS part of the other side. I can log into the fax. I can log into the blade, to the management uh, switch, or the, the management chip on the blade. So a lot of things I can hop onto. So connect. What do I want to do? Do I want to connect to that management chip on the blade? Do I want to connect to a certain fabric extender that's called an IO module? Do I want to connect to NXOS? Well, probably that's what I want to do because that's a very useful CLI. This is unfortunately not available in the simulator. Everything is available in terms of the configuration on the GUI, but not logging into NXOS. And I can choose, do you want to log in on fabric A or fabric B? 
Now what I have here is just an NXOS CLI. So show interface brief, and I see all the ports in my system, uh, a show run. I do have a running configuration here with all kinds of pre-configuration. Uh, but I, do, I have everything except the configuration mode. There is no config terminal, unfortunately. But you can do a lot of verification through here. What I like to do here on the CLI is verify my configuration. For a lot of things, the verification is the best way to do verification is through the use of the NXOS CLI. Because the GUI is doing some things, but especially on the networking part, I mean, we are all networking guys, right? We are focused on our networking part. So that's why uh, the verification on an NXOS CLI gives us much more confidential, uh, gives us much more confidence in uh, promising that what we did in the GUI is actually happening on the CLI. So that's why I like doing this. And it gives me a very good reason to explain some things. So that is my CLI. That is my NXOS CLI. I can hop on and hop off to everybody. Everything else I'm going to do through a GUI. I'm not going to use the CLI to do configuration. All right. So let's move on with the most important part. That is getting my servers discovered. So when I log in to my manager right now, so let me open up a RDP session. All right. So what I do when I initially configured my uh, Fabric Interconnects is just go to the virtual IP address. With a browser. So even on the lab itself, you will do this as well. The UCS manager will be behind an RDP session. Uh, so you will RDP into a new uh, PC or a server and from that PC you will start the UCS manager. So there will be just that desktop link that you saw here, the UCS manager, that's going to be there for you. Uh, you will also see DCNM links here, so I can access the data center network manager here. Now I am running 205B and this is also the software version that they run in the lab or some 205 version. Main advantage is that it supports Java 7. Cisco is currently not using 2.1. Until further notice, of course. So, let's launch this tool. Now, because we're using an RDP, we do not have any issues with Java. You might have experienced, if you're working with a UCS system in production, uh, oh no. Uh, you might have experienced some issues with the whole Java thing and with UCS. It's really, it's terrible. Uh, more, most recently, in the most recent 2.1 version and one of the more recent Java 7 versions just broke everything. There was an issue with HTTPS se uh, sessions with certificates and stuff. It was horror. Especially with the migration from Java 2 or from Java 6 to Java 7. I never understood why. It's always so difficult, but all right. By the way, if you're using a Mac, I would highly recommend in starting the UCS manager in Windows. Some things are just not looking well on the Mac. First of all, these tabs look all funny. And there is even one feature, that feature is called pin groups. That feature is not, you cannot configure that from a Mac. There is some configuration option that's just not available to you. So always use a Windows machine that works best for uh, the UCS manager. 